wonderful welcome everyone uh good afternoon uh, my name is um, James Orbinski, and I'd like to welcome you to our weekly graduate seminar series here at the Dodala Institute for Global Health Research. I'm the director of the Dodala Institute, and I'm delighted to host uh, this rooted and rising team um, who's, who are going to lead today's seminar uh, with uh, what they have titled, uh, quote, Rooted and Rising co-developing experiential education for climate leadership for youth and planetary health. Um, now, before we move in that direction, our usual practice uh, is to begin with a land acknowledgement. And uh, as this is a hybrid event, some guests are on different physical territories. So please do take the time to give thanks and respect um, to the land that you're actually physically on. Uh, and today I'm working and we're here uh, physically at York University campus in uh, Toronto. And York University is situated on the traditional territory uh, that's uh, known as Takaronto. And we acknowledge uh, its current treaty holders, who are the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We also acknowledge um, this is uh, the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations including the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and of course, uh, the Métis. And the territory is subject to the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, which is an agreement uh, to peaceably share and care uh, for the Great Lakes region. Um, so now let me, uh, with that acknowledgement, um, let me just introduce our uh, uh, the seminar with a, a, just a brief um, uh, introduction. Roxanne uh, Cohen uh, um, is an educator and a consultant specializing in education systems uh, and in uh, up, uplifting um, uh, cooperative community leadership. Uh, she's a climate activist and is interested in developing education programs with youth uh, and educators that reimagine how we teach about uh, climate change. Um, Roxanne previously co-founded uh, a group called Conscious Minds Camp and Co-op, and this is a youth-led summer camp for imagining and practicing uh, around the world that we want. Uh, during her PhD, which was on restor uh, restoring education, in the era of climate change, uh, Roxanne um, collaborated uh, to create a Rooted and Rising. And she's now a community fellow here at the Dodala Institute, uh, where she's uh, coordinating and amplifying the work um, that, that is at uh, the Rooted and Rising Lab. Uh, so that's uh, very general, but I think you know pretty stellar. Um, overview of, or, or an overview of a person who is actually pretty stellar in terms of how they approach um, these issues. So in today's seminar, Roxanne and her team, and Roxanne is going to introduce her team. Roxanne and her team will discuss the Rooted and Rising Lab and their approach to co-developing a 13-week hybrid uh, youth climate leadership certificate program. Um, and the program, this program took place this past fall and winter. And it covered uh, topics about climate change and environmental degradation, while also offering students an opportunity to mobilize <clears throat> their aspirations through a final project. Um, Roxanne and her team will then share lessons uh, for theory and practice uh, to explore how co-developing climate education programs can shape a more just, thriving, and joyful future. So now I'm just a little bit of housekeeping before I turn it over to you. Uh, it's a 90 minute uh, seminar uh, and we'll end promptly at uh, 2 30. Uh, we will start with an introduction and presentation of the rooted and rising team which Roxanne is going to do followed by roughly a 20 minute presentation um, and um, uh, then a, uh, uh, a discussion uh, among us uh, people online and people here in person and uh, we will wrap up uh, tightly uh, at uh, uh, 225, I think. Is that right? 225, yeah. And um, we'll take it from there. So with that, Roxanne, welcome and over to you. 
Great. Thank you so much, James, for that introduction. To call him Stellar. <laughs> it feels good. Well, you're kind of all right, so. <laughs> Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and such a pleasure, yeah, to be in a beautiful Dadalay Institute again, um, who are such wonderful supporters of Rooted and Rising. Uh, as Jane said, I am luckily not here alone. Uh, you don't have to listen to me for too long. And I have many others from the team that are here present with us. Uh, Bella, who's right here next to me, Kate and Kristen, who are online as well as some of our students who have joined us to share some of their experience, including Elvin in the room and Marinelle online. And I can't see everyone. I don't know if Marinelle is the only one online so far. We may have one or two more joining as well. Great to see you, Marinelle. Um, and before we dive in, yes, we, so we have a bit of a, a plan here. We're going to introduce ourselves briefly, kind of give you an overview of the program, uh, and then talk about, as James said, kind of our approach, lessons that we've taken away, and then open up to broad discussion. And I'll kind of just facilitate that process a bit. Um, and so perhaps I will, I'll turn it over perhaps to Bella first to, to introduce yourself and maybe a little bit about how you or why you came to be involved in Rooted and Rising. Okay. okay. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Bella. Uh, my pronouns are they and them. I am a white settler on this territory. Um, my family has been in this territory for on the wrong side three generations and father's side, um, not in this specific territory, but on Turtle Island for a similar amount of time. Um, I am, uh, I got involved with Rudin Rising in 2019, I believe. Um, I had uh moved back to Toronto after university and I was like getting involved much more deeply in climate organizing at that time or at least getting involved here um and I met Roxy and heard about Root and Rising and thought that it was sort of a, a wonderful opportunity to um learn alongside other youth because at the time I was a climate justice activist so that uh, it was sort of an interesting, like, developing a program for youth climate activists as a youth climate activist um, and not always knowing what I had to offer, but it's been a really wonderful learning experience and I feel like I've been on my own journey of, um, yeah, learning how to organize and how to advocate for uh, climate justice at the same time as I can. Uh, Kristen, let I turn it over to you next, please. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kristen Jordan Alaan Sison. She, her pronouns. Uh, my ancestors come from the islands that are currently and colonially understood to be the Philippines, but I was born and raised in Dish of Bone Spoon Wampum Treaty Territory on in Scarborough. Very proud to be from Scarborough. But I'm currently calling in from the West Coast in a small little mountain town called Nelson, BC, living in the interior, uh, where it is quite wet and cold, the opposite of where you all are at, which is great for what usually is uh, an intense fire season in the summer. So we're looking good right now. Um, yeah, my pathway into more general community organizing started when I was 16 years old, and I encountered a program that was a mentorship program for young Filipino women to explore our identity as diasporic, like Filipino folks through artistic exploration. And having the opportunity to receive mentorship, um, to be heard, to be invited into curiosity in such a like generative and playful way has put me on a path of commitment to creating those kinds of spaces for other young people, knowing how deeply impactful it was for keeping me on a course that was aligned with my highest path and also, um, yeah, allowed me to contribute to a world that I know is possible, a thriving, harmonious, joyful, just world. And Roxy and I have been co-collaborators for nine years, Roxy, nine years, which is impressive. Um, we came together after graduating from U of T, uh, took a course together, and um, I think mutually us alongside our other coordinators of Conscious Minds Camp at the time, which is now a youth co-op with a new generation of leaders, um, we're just dissatisfied coming out of the education system, very able to articulate and understand what wasn't working well in this world, 
but not feeling like there was space to practice something different, to organize in a direction that felt like it would be more honorable. Um, and so we started to make those spaces, experimental spaces, spaces on the land. Again, it was a summer camp. Um, and yeah, I think we did that for quite some time. And then I returned to my own journeying of holding space for a return to spirit-led um, ways of being through other artistic projects. And anyways, in 2019, which is when our whole kind of Rooted and Rising project uh, was born, um, bringing together this really expert and beautiful intergenerational team. Um, yeah, I was really excited to figure out how to continue this journey of holding space for practice and experimentation with ways to be in community with each other um, uh, that align in a way that aligns with our values. And um, yeah, I'm excited to go into more of it. There's so much more I could say, but I'll, I'll stop myself there and pass it over to Kate. Thank you so much, Kristen, Bella, Roxy. It's um, pretty easy, I think, for you all to understand why I jumped into this project with these lovely young leaders. Um, I was uh, lucky to be invited into the Rooted and Rising project in 2019, and I could immediately see its heart and its center very much in alignment with what I've been able and lucky to do at walking alongside Indigenous particularly Latin American Indigenous feminist uh, scholars and communities, and to try to forge and nurture a new space uh, that education could be education um, within and around climate change, rather than just simply and always about um, the techno-scientific notions of what climate is in terms of climate science. So, um, my name is Kate Tillichuk, and I'm a professor and a Canada Research Chair in the Faculty of Ed Education at York, and I'm also really happy to be a fellow of the Davila Institute of Global Health Research. Really lucky um, to have those two spaces um, happening uh, at York University that really just nourish and nurture both me as um, a feminist scholar, but also these kinds of projects and spaces for young people. I'm a, I'm a proud grandma. I'm a proud mom of uh, two kids who are both justice and trans activists and scholars. And our folks left Ireland during the famine um, to come here to Turtle Island via New York. Uh, onto Prince Edward Island and shared territory there in the unceded Mi'kma'ki um, territory of Mi'kmaq people. Um, today I'm in a different place, but I, I just really wanted to acknowledge and share that um, that was uh, a, a, an important place and remains an important place for me and those relationships. So um, I think I'll just pass it over and um, and let Roxy walk us through more of the detail of the project. Thank you. Thanks everyone for the introduction. And Hannah, I think we can um, share screen now, please, for the presentation. So we're gonna do kind of two, two rounds of talking about the program. One at a very kind of high level, just what are the basics so we're all on the same page, and then a bit of a deeper dive in terms of our approach and lessons that came out of this round. Uh, and I think Bella, you're starting us off by sharing a bit about kind of the details of the program. Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we instead talk about this. Um, so what's Rooted and Rising? Rooted and Rising is an intergenerational network of creating climate education programs for people remembering how to care for the natural world. And Rooted and Rising um, is about tending to the passion of young people um, as they try to figure out how to navigate this sort of crisis for the world. Uh, we're a space of experimentation and we're trying to offer people with school with the young people that come through with schools and that practice in collaboration um, and exposure to expansive ways of thinking and seeing um, that will help them <laughs> in on that journey of climate leadership. Um, so this year's Root and Rising certificate program um, took place over the course of 36 hours. It was uh, nine online classes and four in-person classes. Three of those were here at the in the Global Strategy Lab, and one was on the land 
um, at 440 Parkdale and Hyde Park with the 440 Park side, Park side, Park side Collective. My um, there were 22 youth ages 19 to 30 and seven youth, they, they, and they produced seven youth projects at the end. Um, and we had 10 certifying partners, and I can touch on that on the next slide. But um, the students were joining from all over the GTA, as well as Montreal, London, uh, uh, London, United Kingdom, and London, Ontario. Um, and uh, yeah, as far as sort of all of the places that you see listed here, we had a cohort that included uh, diverse youth with diverse experiences in earthwork and poetry and storytelling and so much more. Um, you know, the youth that come into our program already have so much, uh, so much experience and so much to offer. Um, and so we just want to highlight some of their backgrounds. Um, this is our team. Um, we have our 10 sort of core members listed as advisors and specialists, facilitators. They've been with us since 2019 and uh, consult on program design and all of that. And then uh, our guest facilitators who joined us this round to support with specific sessions um, and our partners listed here. Um, as you can see, we have a wide range, both university and community partners. Um, yeah. This is we want to sure I can speak to this. Yeah. So one thing that we want to always highlight with Root and Rising is though we are a youth climate leadership program, as Kate alluded to, we're not a program about climate change. So this isn't the program where you come and learn what is climate change, what are you know necessarily the techno scientific solutions. We don't kind of exclude that lens, but we're really more interested in supporting youth that are already passionate about responding to the climate crisis and co-creating climate justice. So we create spaces in the program to talk about our different perspectives of climate change, but it's not the program to like learn about the crisis, but rather to think about this is our now our context. We are living in the era of climate change. It's here and it's already happening. And so what does that mean? How does that change how we want to relate to ourselves, to the land, as communities, and across communities as well? And really kind of grounding into that more social and emotional learning and relationship work of how do we build good relationships that can kind of maintain and, and co-create the world we want to build, as well as how do we practice that world? Not only encouraging our students to kind of take up that lens within their projects, but also challenging ourselves as an education program, can we also come to embody the world that we desire and the world that our students are kind of working towards and desiring as well. So kind of thinking about this context as being this dual spiral, we're spiraling deeper into climate crisis and poly crisis and all the interconnected crises, it's getting worse. And also there is a growing global movement and increasing opportunities and possibilities to step outside of that world of crisis and into worlds of care and, and justice. And so really seeing kind of that dual reality as well as many others swirling around it, being the context and then asking, what does it mean to support young people intergenerationally in that context and in that world? And noticing that when education does only focus on what is climate change from that scientific and technical perspective, that we often kind of lose focus of the emotional and educational needs of both students and teachers. And also, uh, it kind of loses focus to imagine that education as an institution, as a practice, is also complicit in the climate crisis. Like the way that we currently do mainstream education might be, as, as Morin's 2020 names, unsustainable education that's currently being practiced, that also needs to be reimagined, unmade, and remade as well. And so kind of we take that up as, as our work to, to be experimenting and remaking education with young people as we go through this process. Um, so I'm going to talk to Kristen to talk about the seven values that are at the core of organizing approach. Yes, these seven values were, um, it took us a couple of sessions, I believe, as the 10 person team that we are 
in 2019 when we were first ideating what Rooted and Rising was to become. And these values create the foundation for how we approach our curriculum building. Um, in the past, we set these values up as if they are a spiral and the sessions that we hold within Rooted and Rising kind of follow the spiral where each session is grounded in one of these seven values. Um, some of the names of these values have changed and adapted over time as we've come to morph our relationship to language. Um, one that is extremely central is gratitude. Um, gratitude honors indigenous leadership, um, like the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving address as it draws our minds together, um, it comes before our, our all else. And so gratitude has um, become embedded as a sort of ritual for us in our program. It's how we begin always. Um, to be grateful also for the discomfort of climate work. Um, and that's something that I think is really special about our program is that we welcome in not only the students, but also teachers and, and the complexity of our emotional beings at this time, even as we are grieving, even as we are in states of discomfort and morphing. Um, care, of course, is a huge uh, underlying principle of how we approach um, this work together. Tension of wanting to save the, the work, the earth and the urgency of this moment while also needing to bring to the front the power of rest and slowness amidst this sense of climate urgency, um, reciprocity, thinking about the politics of who it is that receives care, how and by whom, inviting in the wisdom of our lineages and holding relations and relationality at the center of our program. Um, imagination, and this, this comes up many times, of course, in the program, um, we like to, uh, I don't want to say that we like to create it, but it's kind of a natural reaction of how we do things, but um, inviting in these moments of awe and wonder, as many have said, you know, before we can change the world, we have to love it first. Um, imagining the futures that we desire together and returning to those visions and those imagined futures. Um, we spend a lot of time dreaming and dreaming again and thinking big and thinking beyond these systems that we are currently living within and um, feel the desire to move beyond. And um, inviting in a magical sense of, um, I guess you could say surrender to the uncertainty <laughs> and storytelling new ways of being into being through, through practice, through the way that we show up moment to moment. Um, number four, well-beings has emerged as a, a, especially in this past round, this fall winter as um, central to what we do. Um, well-being speaks to the principles of kinship, of vitality, of flourishing, um, and that's a multi-species sense of wellness, not just human-centered, but inviting in all our more than human relationships into that fold, into that web. Um, and what does it mean to live well is an immensely important question in this time with um, loving yourself is a huge part of it, and um, well-beings used to be named resilience, um, but that's something that we've dropped and adapted from. Disruption, I won't speak too much about this because I think we'll come back to it, um, but disruption speaks to the value of disrupting the status quo, speaking truth to power, um, asserting our own unique lives and gifts and learning paths seeing disruption as a gift and welcoming student disruption within our space. Um, and again, we'll get, get to that later. And uh, what needs to be refused, what needs to be resisted and what needs to be disrupted. A bit of a fiery value there. Um, joy, laughter, play, rest, kindness to self and others. Um, this is immense and, and this is something I think we'll speak to this again later, but it's something I certainly received from the students that um, we had or were lucky enough to receive or be in community with in this round. They were so joyful and it was such a pleasurable and happy space because of who was in the room. Um, and we believe that climate action can and should be joyful and that that is um, a strategy for sustainability and longevity. Um, joy is also at the root of um, a spiritual kinds of lens to this polycrisis moment. 
And this quote I'll read out from Linda Hogan, a Chickasaw poet, um, love her, love her work. She says, here is a lesson. What happens to people and what happens to the land is the same thing. And the last value is self-determination. We've debated a lot about what this one should be named, um, but it's about practicing the world that we desire together across our differences, across our cultures. Um, responsibility, decolonization, honoring indigenous knowledge and leadership and bringing that into the center um, and welcoming in the voices of not just youth, but also elders and collectives and um, centering voices and ways of being that are normally silenced. And so these values undergraded and are the foundation for how we approach the design of our program. And I'll pass it along there. Yeah. Um, so as Kristen mentioned, we open every session with gratitude. Um, gratitude is a way for us to ground into space with each other, a moment to acknowledge the land and all of the beings that support our, uh, and other human beings that support our, um, our being here, being present in any moment, our survival at all times. Um, and uh, we started off the whole program with the, and ended the whole program with the Thanksgiving address. Um, and invited that into the space as a yeah, as a piece of wisdom that has been shared uh, and has been uh, like all people have some been invited into um, that yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is just an overview of class by class I'm not going to go through every single one to not have time but um Basically, you know, we started with uh, an opening ceremony and fire um, at High Park uh, with the members of the 440 Parkside Collective and Andrea Baskin in particular, um, who opened that space for us. And then um, we talked about the narratives of the of climate crisis. Um, we talked about grief and disability justice and death work and how that can inform um, climate justice work. Um, we talked about self-love and understanding leadership and um, trying to sort of transform our conceptions of leadership. Um, then we got into, we got, the youth got into project teams and we started talking about that more specifically how to plan those teams, how to embrace complexity, how to create from a place of desire rather than from a place of, um, of damage, um, really taking, uh, being informed by the work of youth talk. And, um, and then we had some work on interpersonal communication uh, and more, just more time for the students to work on their projects. Um, we ended off with uh, a conversation with Christine Gray from the St. James Town Co-op about uh, how to resource ourselves, both personally and our movements, um, broadly defined. And then we closed, we had the two-part sort of closing uh, practice that uh, involved reflecting on everything that we had learned throughout the program. Um, and this is just some pictures of the opening on the land at Portland Park Five. Um, it's a beautiful space. They have a, a garden and a couple of fire sites, and then this little inside area in the clubhouse. Um, this is us at the Global Strategy Lab uh, when on the day when the students were forming their project groups. And developing their project ideas. Um, and this is sort of the primary project, but yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So one of the unique elements of Unit and Rising, I mean, projects for learning is not exactly unique, but ours is because it's funded. Uh, we get some so we got some support this time from the Youth Harbor, who directly funded the youth project. So we had a project fund. I'm blanking on the amount right now, 3,600. And this was shared amongst all the students, kind of as one big pot of funds that everyone can access, taking what they need and making sure there's enough for all. And so students kind of go through this process halfway through the program. 
we have a class that's dedicated to kind of talking about what kind of projects they want to pursue, getting into project teams. And after that, they have kind of 45 minutes of class time at the end of each class to work on those projects, to access support as needed, uh, and to activate those for about a month. It's a really quick turnaround. They have about two weeks to kind of plan. And then we took a, a break during the winter break and came back together in kind of late January and they had a month to execute, activate them. And then we come back and reflect on those lessons as well. And I won't go into too much detail, but I will share just a little bit about these projects. Those of you in the room will get to pass them around so you can see, you know, each group did something quite unique. And I love that we kind of, we don't set, you know, uh, mandates of what this project should be, how it's supposed to look. We really let students kind of take on climate justice and climate action in a way that makes sense for them. So, you know, we had one group and Marinelle, who's here with us online, she was a part of this group, uh, getting to create a, a guide for community rituals, a multimedia zine that includes a playlist that's getting passed around right now and videos to how to sew that invite us into deeper relationship with ourselves, with the land and with the materials that we use to clothe our bodies as well as a really special resource that then got shared, printed and shared with the teaching team, with all the students and, and with us in community spaces as well. Uh, Elvin and another student worked on a beautiful project of inner child affirmation cards. And I'll pass around my copies and they'll pass around theirs as well. Uh, where really, I mean, I'll even speak about this perhaps a little bit later on, but taking an approach that doesn't normally come to mind when we think climate justice, and yet is so central to us uniquely being able to engage in this work. Uh, what does it mean to reconnect, uh, to care and tend to our inner child? They hand printed these, uh, which is incredible, and also included a second copy for all students to take away with them with a, an envelope that already had a stamp on it so that the idea was you send a copy to a collaborator, to someone you wanna build deeper relation with and use it, these cards and artwork as an opening into that conversation. We had another group that focused on third places and what it means to create community places where we can organize, whether it's for climate justice, gender justice, or whatever it might be, and noticing the lack of those spaces in the GTA and wanting to kind of give a boost to those that do exist and, and create that community space. And these are just some pages from the scene that you have passing around. Yeah. Uh, you know, we had a group, our, our queer joy and abundance group that was really looking to shape narratives and feelings of scarcity and step into an abundance mindset and what that means for queer activists, artists, and thinkers to come into that mode. They created an online kind of uh, digital ritual space to host their own unique ideas surrounding this, to do this reflection work together and create some stickers that kind of give you a QR, QR code to go to that website. And what was really special about this group and talking about disruption is they brought to us and said, this isn't project work. Projects, that's very dry language. It reminds us of school. It reminds us of being forced into things. This is joy work. Uh, for them, this is queer joy work. But for all of us, this is joy work we're engaging with. And we've renamed our projects now. They're no longer called student projects. They're now called student joy works. And that was from this group and, and that inspiration that they brought. Uh, another group was passionate about learning about agriculture and want their whole purpose was to learn. And they connected with another student that already does this work. Um, and Justine held them. They had some workshops around microgreens growing in the city and created some kind of social media posts to, to represent that moment and share what they learned. And another group uh, were focused on water and our relations with water. And they held an event along the Humber River with one of our team members, Doug, who actively and regularly works in that space, uh, who's Metis and Nicole brought them in, did some kind of water teachings, and we did a cleanup. Here you can go to the next slide, I think there's photos of it. There we are, joyfully cleaning up um, the river. It was a really fun, um, beautiful event, and oh my gosh, there's so much trash <laughs> along the river to be cleaned up. There was so much more we didn't get, but I'm, I'm grateful for the pieces that we did. Uh, and finally, a group that was interested, they actually came into the program with their project idea 
wanting to connect with elders in their neighborhood where they grew up, which was Woodbridge, and tap into the sustainability knowledge around food, uh, clothing, uh, energy that their elders already hold, their grandmothers, their grandparents, and to be able to document and create an online space where that kind of intergenerational knowledge can be shared. So quite a, a vast array of projects that were had that do kind of extend beyond classic climate change projects as we might think about them when we just think about climate emissions and really kind of recenter again in these notions of relationships, of inner work, and of building community and what that means with the land as part of that community as well. So I think now we'll, we'll shift to kind of a, a second piece of our discussion here, which is a bit more, maybe more interesting, but we need to lay the groundwork for you here too. And maybe we'll go back to the values slide um, for the team, just because some of us are online in person. I'm just going to say this, we are we are we are going at a pace. We're here. Um, we have about 20 minutes or less for us to kind of chat through these questions and then we'll open it up to all. Um, and I have a few questions that I'm just going to ask and kind of anyone, Bella, Kristen, Kate, myself may answer. Also, in these spaces, Elvin and Marinel, um, we would love if, if you feel called to answer these questions as well from your perspective and experience. This would be a space where, where you can share and also create some space at the end too. Um, yeah, and we really just kind of want to open up and think about, I'm going to ask two questions together just to save a bit of time. I'll save the third one. But really, I, I would be curious to hear from, from us and the team, you know, what were you proud about in this round of Rude and Rising? Or what do you think was really important about our approach that maybe is, is needed? Um, and coming with that, we see all these values on the screen here. There are seven of them. And I'm curious if one of them stands out for you as something that was really important in this round that was maybe embodied or practiced and, and how that, that came up for you. Maybe it was disruption. Maybe it was joy. Maybe it was another one. So anything that comes to mind and kind of what's important about our approach or one value that maybe you want to speak to that came up in this round of the program. Perfect. Starting us off here, then we'll just call on someone. <laughs> I can start us off unless Kristen would like. I'm not seeing something, so I can't really Go tell. For Go for it, Bella. Okay, so um, I know Kristen mentioned that we would probably talk about disruption more. Um, I think that in this round, I mean, in both rounds of the program, we have had moments where students have called attention to uh, the, the limitations of, of certain things that we're sort of presenting to them. Um, in this round, I think it was sort of most notable in our session on interpersonal communication um, when uh, there was uh, some students called attention to um, the perhaps limits of uh, nonviolent communication as a method of, uh, of, of communication and were pointing to the need to sort of um, decolonize or, or like put attention on um, power imbalances in talking about interpersonal communication. Um, and those, I think those moments highlight for us um, that it can be really difficult and challenging and it can be like a moment where we uh, wonder as facilitators, like, did we mess this up? Did we create a program that is like not doing what it needs to do or is like causing harm to the students uh, in some way? And I think that's something that we sit with but also it's something that we recognize is like um, that it's our job to like learn from that discomfort and to create the, the and that actually like creating a space where that kind of disruption is not only possible or tolerated, but like genuinely invited is uh, a huge part of what Rudin Rising is about and indeed is what is necessary in climate justice education because in order to solve the crises that we're faced with right now, we really need to be cultivating leaders who are willing to engage in that kind of disruptive action to, to uh, be you know, uh, ungovernable 
to embrace chaos and creativity and to, you know, I, I, I think in this moment we're seeing, you know, encampments across campuses, across North America, we're, we've seen in the last few years blockades um, in uh, railways and pipeline pathways. And these are, you know, disruptive actions that are absolutely essential to challenging power, to challenging the, 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 the people in power that like continue us on this path of crisis and destruction and violence. And so um, just like creating a space where, where, the, where youth are able to embrace that spirit um, and where us as teachers are forced to embrace the spirit of like uncertainty and uh, discomfort is like uh, a huge part, I think, of what, what Root and Resin does and um, what makes it both challenging and, and beautiful. Yeah. Can I jump in on that? Roxy, it, it, Kristen, is that okay? Just it, because it is a follow-up. I mean, disruption is one of my favorite values. And I, I wanted to say too, to your question, like what, what makes me proud is that the course itself, the process, I can't even call it a course, the experiment, the space um, begins in values. And it's part of what I was always quite excited about that we didn't create curriculum and dump it on top because there was knowledge that wasn't yet known. We wanted to find out, first of all, how will we proceed? And then which content will follow the kind of processes um, along that. And in relation to disruption, Bella, I, I so agree. I wasn't there for that course, but the course, the, the workshop that you and I did, that Bella and I did together this time on uh, sort of, disrupting the digital or the place of digital tech within the climate crisis was also a really interesting space that opened up both in the first iteration of Rooted and Rising and in this one, and that we invited um, the, the young people into the collaborative creation of a manifesto. What does it mean to live well in the digital age and the climate age? And watching and listening and learning about the depth of the dots that were connected around extractivism and colonialism and oh my goodness isn't that the same in tech as it is in the climate was this really important and um, and joyful place for me to hear and to learn how that disruption looks and what I can in my own work then take away from from the lessons that I learned. So um, I think I'll leave it at that. And uh, Kristen likely wants to jump in. Thank you, Kate. That was actually one of the most impactful um, classes in this round of Rooted and Rising for me, the, the class you two facilitated. And yeah, thank you both for the disruption of that space. Um, yeah, I'll kind of draw like a triangle between like value two, care, four, well-being, and six, joy. And um, I think that part of the feeling of joy and wellness that I, I received being in this program was part of um, what the students offered and arrived with. Um, we had Marinelle being one of them <laughs> disrupting and like in, in the Joker kind of archetype like that was so welcome and so needed during this time so we were uh we we launched in october and then went until february and fall and winter um have the tone of being uh grief heavy slow um kind of dark and i can say that i entered this program feeling some of that in our collective human experience um but rooted and rising for me while I arrived in such a way, like laden with grief and and um, anger, by the end of this program, I really felt so buoyed, like held and lifted by having a space to show up where we were welcomed in that state of grief and discomfort. And in that space of welcoming 
something could dissolve. Those things could be witnessed and then dissolved to let what else wants to come through, which which is joy, which is um, the pleasure of being in community with other people who share your values. Um, and well-being for me, yeah, well-being is, is really crucial for me. I think of uh, a teaching that I've received from a woman named Maria Montejo, who I, I always honor as a teacher in my in my life. And when we were running CMC, she said to us in a session, each of us are a cell on this shared earth body. And so what does it look like and mean for us if we understand ourselves as individual cells on a shared earth body to be well, to experience joy, to live into a, a state of feeling liberated, of feeling free? Um, and how can we live into that experience and that offer that into the collective? And I feel like this space was an opportunity to like test that out on our own and in our individual paths and then come back together and be like, okay, how is that going for you? Like, and you can you can feel it. I feel like there was such um, generative joy and softness in how we held the space as um, the Root and Arising Lab team, but then also how our students held us and the care and how they held each other. Um, and it really has just given me so much strength and so much hope to be in these kinds of spaces with young people who are doing the work and who are so so impressive. <laughs> so incredibly impressive. Um, yeah, so I think I think that's all I have to say in this moment. I'm, I'm curious if, Roxy, if there's anything that you wanted to jump in on. Um, but yeah, that that softness as a tone in an educational space, that, that welcoming, um, I feel like there's something very profound there because then the gifts and the wisdom that are in the room, not only from us as, as teachers, I believe that part of what we do is disrupting this hierarchical, um, kind of way that education has been done colonially um, and really letting letting the youth teach us and show us and, and guide us too. Um, yeah, and I, I feel, yeah, I just feel stronger because of this work and because of those who I get to be in community with. I, I actually am gonna hold off on sharing myself and for uh, time, I think I'm gonna open up to Elvin and Marino, uh, whether you want to answer that question directly or just speak from the heart generally, anything, and no pressure if you don't feel like sharing now that you're here, it's no problem at all. Uh, so you just be like, no. But yeah, anything that, that's coming to your mind or heart from your time in Rooted and Rising that you might want to share, or something that was important, or just anything. Yeah, I think going back with the values, I, I was in. I like dropped out of like three programs in university because of my neurodivergency and also just like being into this space. I've learned that even you just saying that you put the values first, every program I've been into, you never put the uh, values first. I was in early childhood education and I really thought that care would be like the first priority for like students, but it was never, it was always curriculum. It was always, deadlines, this and this. But the fact that Rooted and Rising really was rooted in the values of really embodying what you just said and like putting the students first was something that I've been like craving and what I needed in a space of education and like really learning from one another because everyone provides living wisdom and experiences and that I have a place in this community than just being a number or a student paying X amount of dollars to receive knowledge and a paper. So the fact that Root and Rising like really dismantled that then allowed disruption to happen. I was very vocal in class. I was like not afraid to do that. And that the fact that in certain spaces in education that I participated in, whenever I disrupted, I was penalized. I was like subjugated to these things. And that's why I dropped out. There's a lot of like mental health disarray that I had to go through because of the colonial capitalist structures of the education system. But the fact that we didn't rising, like reimagine that and the fact that I was able to like participate that in that space with 
such care with other caring individuals being liberated in like the existence of what we call life was truly magical. And it's like been at the top of my like healing journey of like 10 years of education um, post-secondary. So like, yeah, like honestly honored and felt like my inner child like really needed what in really needed, like really being able to like play with the people I was in community with, because that's what education is as like an early childhood educator who trained in that. Like it really is just like learning from one another and like envisioning a world of care and joy because that's what we really need in the world. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that, Alvin. It would be fun. Thank you. Um, and I just, I, before I turn it over, <laughs> before I turn it over to Marinelle to hear your thoughts as well, I guess I, I'm just prompted by what you shared, Alvin, to share like some of those specifics because we can say care, we've centered care, and how did we actually do that? Some of those ways are un intangible, I can't name them, but some of those really clear, specific ways were, you know, we made sure when we came together that we had good food, that we were fed uh, and nourished in a good way. And for me, that was one of the ways that I also learned through the program as someone holding a lot of the kind of administrative and, and logistical organizing roles, I get inundated with doing that. And we did our program as pay what you can this time. We believe you should be paid to do this kind of education because it's benefiting all of us. When that's not possible, we believe it should be free. When that's not possible due to funding restraints as it was for us, we believe it should be pay what you can. So no one is, you know, uh, everyone who wants to be a part of that can. And part of that pay what you can was we allowed students to pay in other ways other than money, like helping to prepare the meals for our in-person classes, something really simple. Some students took that up and oh my gosh, for me as an organizer and teacher, I felt so helped. Shockingly, I was surprised at how important it was to be with students, making that food plan together. They would make dishes, I would make dishes and we'd bring it together. And it just all, even just that small act shifted kind of who's in charge, who's receiving because we were all in charge and we were all receiving in that small act. You know, we would do things like, if students weren't there in class, they didn't show up, we texted them. We didn't just leave them alone. <laughs> and that always feels a bit uncomfortable as the teacher to text and it feels like maybe I'm pushing where I shouldn't be. And yet each round we've done this, we've received feedback back that that was really important, that students felt like they actually were thought of. Uh, and we would text them and say, hey, are you coming to class? You know, what's going on? How are you doing? Uh, and those kind of small little actions, I think for me, are what kind of really create that caring space. Um, and I'll pause it there and there and all on, on screen somewhere with us. I don't know if you feel called to share anything about your experience or what felt important to you or what you're taking mm -hmm. away from the program. Ooh, what to talk to you about? Like, I don't think I'll we'll ever have enough time in this lifetime to talk, to debrief about Rooted and Rising, if I'm being honest, um, for better or for worse. But, um, yeah, I the value that's um, resonating the most with me right now is gratitude and just such immense gratitude to all of the beings, um, human and more than human and energies of the highest good and all of this, just gratitude to like, the entirety of like rooted and rising and all that it um weaves with and stretches out to and that's something that I feel like in terms of the depths of the gratitude that I feel towards rooted and rising uh to all of my we, we would refer to um like I refer to my peers as co-conspirators because we we're like disrupting together and also the teaching team. So we're all all of the co-conspirators uh, in in um, rooted and rising. Like the depth of that gratitude, I I don't recall feeling this like aware of of gratitude in in a lot of like educational spaces um, and being really intentional with voicing my gratitude and expressing my gratitude in spoken and unspoken ways. 
um, and just even like, I think it, it's kind of like the cherry on top, but also the foundation that um, builds the stew of that nourishes all of us is like knowing that um, you are being seen and witnessed for all of, for just existing and all of the efforts that you have done and what, what you do. Um, and yeah, just to be seen, because I feel like a lot of the time I've experienced not being seen in, in my efforts. And I really felt that gratitude was and is still present in, in the Rooted and Rising program. What like even stretching out to now that the um, cohort has ended, like I'm still in contact um, and in relation with um, my other co-conspirators and there's still that gratitude there. So yeah, I guess what I'm trying to voice is that that's something, that's a core value of uh, Rooted and Rising that I would love to see um, and that I um, am continuing to embody in my own life. Um, if anything, the values for Rooted and Rising are kind of like a, um, a blueprint or in a sense or kind of like I don't want to say guidelines but they're kind of like um guiders for for me speaking from my my heart like of ways that I want to live my life um and be in right relation with the land and kin so yeah like I think that gratitude is such an important um integral part of creating spaces like these to um for people to just feel and to feel feel their emotions that we have suppressed um that I have suppressed but also to feel welcome to feel seen um to remember to be grateful for what is um what else? Oh, just just an opportunity to say I love you to the teaching team. <laughs> um, yeah, it's if you ever get a chance to be a, a program participant of Rooted and Rising, I cannot express in words how um, beautiful and potent and magical it is. So if you have that opportunity, I highly, 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 highly um push you, urge you, usher you into, into um, exploring um, the space and, and the community as well of Rooted and Rising. Hey, Marinel, we love you too. And also, one of our other students has just joined, Alessia. And one thing that I would love to just jump in on um, that, Marinel, you kind of sparked for me uh, as an emergent quality of this past round of the program we had numerous points of feedback. And I think Alessia, you were one of the people who gave that feedback that um, there was this kind of re-enchantment of a sense of curiosity and connection to our ancestral lineages and the ways in which those wise and well ancestors within our own embodied lineages were welcomed into the space. And that was not something that was an outright intention of Rooted and Rising. That's something that I have experienced as an outright intention in other aspects of my work in decolonizing Filipino um, spaces. And that was something that was a really beautiful outcome. Um, yeah, and something that I think that I personally would love to lean into more in future iterations of Rooted and Rising, because I believe there's such, such a well of wisdom within those lineages. And um, it's really cool that that emerged without that being intended. Um, yeah, and Roxy, I know that you're kind of holding this down, but I'm curious if Alessia, I, don't, I know you just jumped in, um, but we were just speaking to or asking what kind of, um, yeah, impressions or things that you might want to share into the space about your experience of Rooted and Rising are, and you can say no, oh, and Kale's here. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alicia. I use she and they pronouns um, and I apologize for being late. I had a series of meetings prior to this one, but I'm so grateful 
um, that I could be here with you all. Marinelle, so nice to see your face again. Kristen, Bella, Roxy. Um, I I really have so much um, sunshine to spread uh, when it comes to Rooted and Rising. Um, I will share a little bit about my own lived experience as a leader in my community. Um, I am one of two co-executive directors for a nonprofit organization called TransCare Plus, and we are a virtual national nonprofit that advocates for equitable access to health, wellness, and care for trans and gender diverse folks across so-called Canada. Um, and the reason that I bring this into the conversation is that because is because prior to um, beginning the Rooted and Rising program, I had actually just gotten this, um, what I will put into quotations, promotion um, to being the co-ED at TransCare Plus. Um, and at a time where I had no experience in the nonprofit sector whatsoever, um, and really uh, got this position through my relationship building and through uh, smaller advocacy work and academic work, um, I really had to tease out quite quickly what it meant um, for me to be in a leadership position that I had felt uh, very unprepared and like an imposter um, to be in that space. And Rooted and Rising came at a, a very magical and I think a pivotal time in me kind of like understanding and defining that. Um, and I think being in a space where there was plenty of other youth, specifically BIPOC youth, who um, were reclaiming their uh, lineages ancestrally and reclaiming what it meant to be in relationship to one another. Um, and though this, the the root and rising, um, this practice is, is centered around climate activism, I think all are uh, our resistance and our freedom is linked to one another. And so that helped me understand this from, from various other intersecting perspectives. Um, and it was from really hearing and being in space with people and like actively like carving out a space to be able to, um, to listen and not just to respond to one another has been pivotal pivotal in, in, in how I move through my leadership practice now. Um, I continue to be the co-ED at these, this organization, and I've actually taken um, Rooted and Rising with me in that being able to bring them to our um, retreat um, that happened about two weeks ago. Um, also meeting uh, Clementina, who was one of the speakers and workshop facilitators and bringing them to do that, sim that same work, but also different work with our organization as well. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like there's so much more that I could say um, about the three of you and Rooted and Rising and, and how much this has brought me. But um, I think I will also leave it up to folks to ask questions. I, I, I really will share anything and everything that folks would like to know. Um, but I have no doubt in my mind that Rooted and Rising has brought um, the other folks part of this cohort and previous cohorts the same kind of magic um, and connection to self that I did not even know I was looking for and yearning for. Um, and I think it's it's through Rooted and Rising that I've been able to really ground myself in, in who I am in my identity, as part of my ancestors, as part of a um, this ecosystem that we are living in, because we're all connected, um, and really in what it means to re-indigenize myself as a person who is a settler on lands that are not my own, um, and has really allowed me to call that into conversations that a lot of the times are seemingly they they they're not in like that that is not an important piece or a, a part of the conversation. But I think the things that we are rooted in and who we are as people are part of every single conversation. So I always like to bring that in and and always ask myself like, what would my life be like had I been growing up on my ancestral lands, and what do I owe? Um, the people of these lands, the indigenous indigenous peoples of these lands as well, um, to practice in my leadership, um, both in so-called Canada, but also around the globe as well. Thank you so much for sharing. And you set us up perfectly by saying, you know, you'll answer any question that's had because I think that that is the time. We're going to open it up now. 
uh, to everyone online and in person. We have, I think, about 20 minutes here to chat together. Any questions are welcome, but also any comments, any experiences that you might want to share that are aligned for the, for the teaching team, for the students that are present with us. And James, I saw your hand already yep. inching forward. So go. <laughs> well, first, um, I'd just like to thank everyone for uh, a really beautiful presentation and um, a very heartfelt presentation with like real illumination experience for each of the students especially but also for you Roxy and for Kate um I, I feel like at, at least in an hour and a half you know without having gone through the experience at least I have a sense of what it is and um it seems incredibly beautiful um and in many ways you know my first reaction is that it's a kind of I mean speaking as a as a, a, my mindset is, I'm a medical doctor, I've practiced medicine for many years, so I always think of uh, how do you, uh, what is healing? And, and in many ways, what you've described is a kind of, at least my first reaction is that you've described a, a, an experience that's an antidote. It's an antidote to toxicity that, that has somehow uh, uh, become part of what we are mm -hmm. uh, as humans. Um, and I think it's very beautiful, uh, really, truly, truly beautiful. Um, and I have many thoughts and many questions, uh, but the one that I really wanna ask you um, is about conflict and um, disagreement um, and dissonance. Because if we even just go back to the idea of, the an of antidote, it's an antidote to something. It's a response to something. There is then inherently between the, the 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 toxin and the antidote. There's inherently there's a moment of choice. There's also a moment of friction, right? Now, uh, so conflict. And you talked a little bit about it. You know, the, the being discomfort, feeling discomfort, and um, recognizing that actually is an inherent part of your uh, process. Right? Now, I think of. So I'm really curious just to hear more uh, about that and the, just your language and how you think about that. And, and I, I, you know, I think of when I think of conflict, you know, I think of there's many ways one can approach that. And one can one is with violence to stop it uh, and to inflict force right, violently um, with a view to causing harm. That's violence, at least in my way. Um, one can also use force, which is not the same thing as violence. Intention is fundamentally different. Um, but um, but sometimes, at least in my view, force is sometimes necessary. Um, and then the other response to conflict is dialogue. And what do you do um, in a situation where you are confronted uh, with uh, a genuine threat uh, and where there is no will for dialogue on the other side. And I think of, uh, just just bear with me for another minute. I think of, um, yeah, I think of the, the Gandhi movement, the Ahimsa movement, um, rooted in you know, Tolstoy's uh, experience of, of, of uh, inequity in, in Tsarist Russia. Uh, that really was actually hugely influential on Gandhi. And Gandhi rooted that experience or that shared experience uh, in his own cultural space, in India, um, and then in his own Hindu religious root, his own ancestral lineage. I'm not pointing to as Hindu, don't worry. <laughs> um, and then he came up with this, 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 or he expressed this idea that is actually inherent uh, in Vedantic and Hindu perspective, this idea of ahimsa, which is which is nonviolence, but it's not just nonviolence; it's doing, it's engaging, it's action, but from a place of love, and with a view to um, both being and becoming, not just of oneself but of a broader community. And so I think, and inherent there was was a willingness to confront 
uh, but also to be confronted, right? And to, um, uh, and not simply in the heroic sense of, you know, taking violence, right? Accepting violence, because that actually is part of the ahimsa. Uh, but also in the, in, the, in the, I actually think the more meaningful sense of actively trying to bring the other into a different way of being. Uh, so in all of that, that's a long kind of preamble. But, but I think the key, for me, the key question is, how do you deal with dissonance? How do you deal with, with um, disagreement, with conflict, uh, with um, uh, uh, those who don't want to be engaged? Uh, and where do you see rooted and rising going around those those issues? Great question. Yeah, I think Kristen and Kate both went off mute, so maybe we'll go to yeah. Kristen and then Kate and then sure. yeah. Just the one thing that I'll say is it's really interesting, James, that you bring that up. Um, we just signed or are about to sign some agreements with one of our par partner organizations. They're called Greenhouse Theater, um, taking up the work of stewardship primarily through the intersection of art and ritual. And we have been invited in as partners in uh, an application that they submitted around conflict transformation in the arts. So just pegging that there as a, ah, oh, interesting that you brought this up. We will be doing some deeper diving and training actually in this um, realm. So I just wanted to name that. That's all I really had to say. I'm curious what my teammates have to offer though. Oh, that's exciting, uh, Kristen. And, and to engage art in that space of what James is pointing out rightly, diplomacy and dialogue. And I really love that you've brought the Gandhian notion of these sort of practices of living well, which in some ways is how we approach this. How can we together in kinship and relation think about how one lives well now? And that opens up the space to move between the individual and the political and the metapolitical. And so in the Gandhian sense, what are what were his practices through education, training, self-training, awareness that both shifted his own <clears throat> and the lives of others around him all the way to a political space and taking up those kinds of tensions or what was once thought of as a, a bifurcated individual political change and to make it in all those spaces. You know, so answering the question, what is it to live well is to make these individual shifts that may or may not help to shift the political as well. And I mean, I don't think for me, um, becoming part of Rooted and Rising, that wasn't sort of a concept or construct that I went in there with, um, but rather hearing you articulate it. You know, what is the place of that in diplomacy or dialogue or coming together? living well together in a new way now under these exact political um, issues is, is a really important part of what I'm sort of taking away in this and other projects and watching, listening, uh, being privy to the sort of ways in which these young people are coming to ask themselves and then practice the arts of living well now and within these poly crises for me allows to see the really complex relation between individual political level healing. And, and maybe I'll just leave it at that, uh, Roxy and Bella, for your input. Yeah. Um, I have, I think my thoughts are going in a few directions. And uh, on one hand, there's this question of how we in the program deal with conflict. And I think that generally uh, we embrace conflict as a as a learning opportunity. And um, I uh, have been immersed in sort of conflict transformation since I was very young. This is my mom also has done for many years, and uh, have encountered this idea that when there is a conflict, we have a choice to either enter deeper into relationships or to break the relationship. And uh, and that like a generative approach to conflict is one in which we 
enter deeper into relationship. But the other part of the question that I think is interesting is maybe conflict in like a broader political sense. And as an organizer, um, I think about the fact that there are problems in our world wherein uh, we are in inherently adversarial relationships with people who do not have our interests at heart. You know, I, I think there are, is a need to create, and I think this is part of disruption and something that I've been thinking about, which is like, how do we not just cultivate a spirit of disruption within the space of our of our um, class that is some so that is uh, you know allowing for this kind of chaotic or uncertain energy, but also create frameworks that allow this sort of discipline and method that allows us to create a collective disruption, a militancy in our organizing that will create like create the kind of people power that we need to transform society because it's not going to change on its own. It's not going to change even because we all believed it should change. Uh, we have to take that action and we have to take that action together and we have to find, you know, structure and, and method even as, even in order to cultivate broader disruption, broader in order to enter into these conflicts that are sometimes um, where we are genuinely at odds with people, where we do have, you know, adversaries who um, who want to continue business as usual, who want to continue to profit off of everyone else's suffering. Um, so that's something I've been thinking about and how to bring that perhaps into the program. One. Anyone else has anything to call? <laughs> I feel like this is a three hour discussion. In yeah. <laughs> so maybe, yeah, we'll see if there's other questions or questions. Maybe Leslie or Marinelle or Kiel or Elvin want to add anything to that one too? I think I would love to add. I was like trying to type it in the chat, but I'm bad at writing. I'm good at talking. Um, is that I think this, this, living well um, embodiment is something that is practiced throughout the entirety of the program. And I think it's really interesting because I think there's many ways where folks could have like participated this like within the program and really resisted some of the lessons and the teachings that were taught. Um, and I think as somebody who is who was coming into a lot of like feelings and emotions and connections that I hadn't felt at all or in a really long time, like there was some resistance on my part some days as well. Um, but I think that the first kind of gathering that Rooted and Rising does is a wonderful filter for um, the folks that maybe aren't ready yet to, to take part in that experience and really allows for people to enter this space, understanding the like collective responsibility and um a, like almost a, a dismantling of like societal practices that we're so comfortable with um and to put that into perspective I think like that's something that I've also been able to take into my leadership practice and thinking about like what does my relationship look like with funders for example and our biggest funder being the Canadian government so on a really like systemic and social level is how do we then um what are what are the avenues that we're willing to take and what are the discussions that we're willing to have and what is the conflict that we are uh ready able and willing to come into contact with when trying to keep our organization not just afloat but thriving which is what our goal is um and part of that has been to choose not to register as a charitable organization to be able to say Free Palestine as an organization is integral and important to us as individuals, as a value that our organization holds, and as who we are as, as people with as queer people. Um, and another part about of that has been how do we then like get creative and diversify our funding outside of these conflicts that that 
the government is creating against us, um, knowing that they have full control, um, that they have all the power, and that we are people within community just trying to um, mitigate those harms and trying to thrive within that. I don't, I don't really have a question, but I just want to say thanks to you all for this really nice presentation. And just thinking about like being a higher education institution right now, and I'm quite aware of the shortcomings of how we educate and how weird and warped we come to think of this education are. So it was just really nice and thoughtful positive to see such a different model. And I just want to hear. So that it's a state of some thought of how, how we can do better in this particular education. Other comments, questions, thoughts that are emerging from this uh, juicy conversation here? <laughs> Perhaps, I mean, we have three minutes left. I know, Kiel, you joined us late as well. Perhaps this is a moment, if there's anything on your heart or mind that you want to share about Ruben Rising or any of these conversations that we've been hearing. Um, Hi. You can hear from me for like three minutes. <laughs> hey. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, hi, uh, I hope I, I'm audible. Because, like, yeah. internet in the Philippines is really bad. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I really love that conversation on conflict. Um, so I am part of the global health program. Um, in our classes, it's always been told we have to look at the bigger picture of things. But like, I think rooted and rising was designed to help us look at the smaller pictures of things because they're just as important as the big pictures. So those little details in the painting, I'm noticing them. The art of noticing is just as important as the bigger issue. So like, simple conflicts like. We didn't respond to the email on time, or we weren't able to get the 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 snacks on time on the venue. So it was a hassle for the speaker, for example. So simple conflicts like those, I think it's teaching us to be more prepared for the bigger world. That if we can resolve smaller issues right now, then we can solve the bigger issues later on. And I think that's the lesson I learned here in Rooted and Rising because like the facilitators, the facilitators were so patient with me because like I was also navigating the strike at York. I was navigating all of these issues. I didn't know what global health issue I was passionate about because like um, we they do offer four streams in our program, but I'm like, oh, which one do I choose? Because all issues are important, but I'm like, I don't know what. And this program was able to help me choose which one I'm passionate about. And um, I really like how it's really reminding me of my heritage as a as an indigenous descent person, because like I'm afraid of using my indigenous ancestry because like I don't know completely what my tribe was about. So I feel like I'm exploiting their struggle, knowing that I wasn't part of them growing up. But now I feel like I've I've had a knowledge, a power that was born epistemically, like it was built on education research, learning about the Humber River, learning the struggles of Métis people, learning the struggles of all these indigenous lands. And, and it's so similar to the experiences we've had here in the Philippines. Uh, we also look at the river, not just as a, as a body of water, but also a sister river. So like, all kinds of pollution, all kinds of bacteria contaminating the river, we consider it as a living being that is sick. So it's not just boiling the water, because like boiling the water is like, hey, we're killing the patient because um, the water is a living thing. You can't just boil it alive. So like um, putting all of these considerations through this program, I think um, it's, a, it's an important step in decolonizing and putting indigenous voices like uh, my ancestors have been putting for years. Um, no one was listening to them, but now I think I was trained in a way 
that we can actually put these voices in the right places. So yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Kiara. Beautiful place to, to end on. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, well, you did it. We're right on time. <laughs> so let me just uh, close for you uh, yeah. or for, for, for our formal session. And just thank you, everyone, for, as I said earlier, a really beautiful and truly illuminating uh, seminar. And it really, um, you know, just Chloe had talked about the the reality of the, the machine that we're in uh, and uh, the grinding kind of nature of its its rotating kind of uh, gears and how it, you know, and when I heard you refer to that, it wasn't your language, that's mine, so I don't want to impose that on you. Um, it, it just made me realize, um, you know, there is the power of the machine kind of thing. And there is the power of the system, the status quo, and, and that clearly uh, you know, let's create a bit of a mess. Let's let's uh, let's just leave it at that. Um, but there's there is also uh, our a power that exists as an antidote to that. And it seems to me that that what I'm hearing from 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 your your experience in offering these workshops is that you're exploring how to uh, know that power uh, and how to uh, how to allow it to come together into a meaningful alternative. And I think my reference earlier to to uh, to Gandhi um, uh, is is. Um, I think an important reference, and, and not just Gandhi, but but uh, Gandhi was one exemplar, and not as a person. I don't mean the man. I mean I mean the movement, um, and the same with with uh, the civil rights movement in the United States uh, under Martin Luther King, largely, but also Malcolm X. Right? And so there, there's a uh, there's I, I think what I'm seeing here is the possibility of of coming to know what that power is and um, uh, and then coming to know uh, how to exercise that right, in pursuit of the good of the good um, and um, and to do it in a manner that that um, is exemplary of a viable alternative and I, I find that quite beautiful actually and, and really powerful. Uh, and um, again, I just thank you, you know, for for sharing. Uh, and I really encourage, um, really encourage you to to, to explore, keep going. Um, and the um, you know the partnership uh, for youth and planetary well-being, Kate's Lab, uh, has been exploring dimensions of this uh, for a very long time, uh, and. Um, uh, there is, uh, at least in my uh, estimation uh, and reading and learning uh, from and with Kate, uh, there's great wisdom there. You know, there's really great wisdom there. And um, and I hope you draw on it. Uh, and I hope you continue to, to grow and to thrive. And with that, thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure listening to you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so, um, I'm now going to, I guess, the, my job uh, is to declare this over. <laughs> so we're done. <laughs> Thanks.